Hello, everybody. I enjoy doing the live streams so much. I decided to try to do them uh, once a day for an hour or so. So I just got started. Let's see if people are coming in into the into the live chat. I'll interact with you. You know, uh, it surprises myself a little bit that I keep having stuff to talk about, which is necessary if you want to have a show, right? And so I made some notes for today. I got my notes over here. Uh, I'm going to go through some topics and uh, maybe I'll start with something on a personal note. Like when I was younger, if I would be invited to like a social event, like a birthday party or something, I might have felt like unwanted in a sense that I didn't know for sure if I was uh, supposed to be there. You know, if uh, people were going to like me or not, I suppose lots of people have that kind of feeling. But I would then decide to minimize myself, basically, to basically sit in a corner or so. Even though, strangely, I was actually an extrovert, but I had some I had a troubled childhood, basically, which led me to believe that I was not wanted or wasn't supposed to be there. And so as a consequence of that, when when I went to a birthday party, for example, I minimized myself. I did not really interact with people, didn't seek them out. And then I'm thinking to myself, I'm doing what is expected of me. Right. This is this is how it is. Right. And it's not. So uh, and then I noticed that other people there get frustrated with me. Like, why isn't he more active? Why isn't he more talking more? Even though I wanted to because I'm naturally quite an extrovert. Right. But I just didn't know for sure if I was if I was accepted. Right. But the people did accept me right right off the bat, basically. And they were simply frustrated with the fact that I didn't approach them or didn't talk to them or didn't interact with them, didn't give them the social interaction that they were there for. They they wanted to have social interaction. Right. And so that's why uh, those people would then sometimes some of them might get a bit angry with me. And then I misinterpreted that anger, thinking that, oh, I should make myself even smaller to get out of the way of these people. I didn't want to anger anybody. And that's that's what I did wrong. Now I understand this is that most people do enjoy so my social interaction. And so I should just approach these people anyway. And in the rare occasion that someone really doesn't like me, I'll just avoid those. But that would be an exception almost, at least in the normal human, uh, you know, social interactions. Those kinds of things are exceptions, you know. Uh, I'm going to put my uh, browser on screen because I can uh, show you some images while I talk about things. Uh, uh, let me Google um, Rico Verhoeven. Rico Verhoeven is that huge kickbox fighter in the Netherlands. I think he weighs like 122 kilograms, pure muscle. He's, he's about my size. He's, I think he's 193 centimeters or so. I'm a bit taller than him, but I don't weigh as much. Uh, and I'm not a fighter. But uh, here, here, this is the message. Okay, this is in Dutch, but I just want to show you that this guy, all oh, the pop-ups, man. This guy, Rico Verhoeven, he went through an 86-hour fasting period. He only had water, pure fasting. But that must have cost him a ton of muscle. Uh, because I think after a day or two, you start digesting some muscle. Muscle is quite resilient, though. The first few days of uh, fasting, you don't immediately start losing muscle. But after three days... I definitely bet you start losing muscle. And I would never do this voluntarily. And I don't rec recommend people going uh, off food for how much is that? 86 hours is like four days or so, right? I would never do that. But I did once accidentally have this experience. And I can tell you it is a very good experience to have it once, not to do it repeatedly. I went hiking in Norway uh, for three days, was hiking up a hill. But... Uh, I lost my appetite for some strange reason. Uh, I was really exerting myself, walking up the hill, carrying up uh, 30 kilograms of uh, Proviant and backpack in my backpack, right? And I had heavy boots on, you know, I had everything with me. I had enough food with me for, for a whole week, but I didn't really feel like eating that much. I don't know why. I simply focused on, on the, um, the physical, physical exertion. It started to rain on day two uh, and... And the, the path that I was trying to follow was not marked that well. It was hard to find my way. I ha had to go through these very rocky places where at one point, um, there were, because there was a lot of snow that started to melt, you have these streams everywhere. Most of them are easily jumped over, but some of them were so wide. I'm wondering to myself, like, am I even in the right place? Am I supposed to be here? Am I even supposed to do this at all? And... 
and it was really exciting then you go looking for a place where you can cross this stream and there was this one place where i had to risk it so i took off my backpack threw my backpack across the stream and luckily it landed without falling into the water or it might have flushed out i would have lost all my all my equipment uh, and then i just jumped it i jumped a little bit you know these small things um you know, they look really scary before you do them. But once you've succeeded without falling or slipping, you feel really proud of yourself that you were able to do that because I was all by myself. It was quite dangerous. So, like I said, I'm very hungry. I'm getting very hungry because I'm not really uh, eating that much. Uh, I had everything with me, my, my cooker, my mini stove and so on and fuel. I had everything. I just didn't feel like eating. And I kept walking on. Uh, to a point where you have these very icy slopes, snowy slopes, but the snow is frozen. And so you have to uh, like kick your boots into the snow not in order not to slip, right? Um, I don't know if I can put up, put up some pictures here. I don't even remember what it was called. Well, wait, it was called the Hard, Hard Danger with, uh, in Norway. Maybe I can show you some pictures of where I was. Uh, here, this is a sort of, well, yeah, something like, this is what it looked like. Wait, oh, wait, I gotta be able to... I hate it when Google doesn't show you the picture I want to see. Places like this, basically. Here, this is quite clear on screen, I hope. Uh, well, it's a bit uh, out of focus, this photo. But things like this is where I was hiking through. Uh, as you can see here, let me look at some more. Anyway, here, this is the sort of place I was hiking through, but in my case, there was more snow and it was raining. At some point, there was also fog, heavy fog. I couldn't see far anymore. And so after three days of doing this, bar barely eating anything, uh, I got shivers like hypothermia. And of course, I had my tent and my sleeping bag. So I was warm. I was definitely warm uh, sleeping at night. But then after three days, uh, I was I was done hiking. I went back. Oh, going back took only one day because it took me three days to go up the up the mountain. Only one day down. Uh, and when I went down, um, still didn't feel like eating. Got on the bus, still didn't feel like eating. And then I got back to my uh, my hostel or my hotel room. And then I noticed it, that uh, I started eating again, right? Uh, some basic bread or something. And I felt after three days or so of this fasting exercise, I felt really strong. What happens is, as a man at least, I can tell you after three days of fasting, boom, your testosterone spikes the very minute you start eating again. And why is that? Why does your testosterone explode after some days of, uh, of, uh, of fasting? Uh, it happened, I think, when you start eating again, um, your body wants to eat wants you to survive <laughs> your body wants you to live and if you're a man you're just going to uh have that uh that massive massive uh, uh testosterone boost kick in to basically help you survive and that survival kick that survival instinct is very very pleasant it lasted very long can you guess how long it lasted almost a whole week where it was as though i was on viagra really extreme so yeah, it is a very pleasant experience to do this hardcore fasting. Uh, but although at the same time, I wouldn't want to do this voluntarily because it was, it was hard, you know? And I don't know why I lost my appetite hiking. Uh, maybe I was just, because I was by myself, I was focused really on my thoughts and the experience and so on. I Meaning I thought it was pretty hard to do. I was really exhausting myself. I was doing things that resembled mountaineering more than hiking, things that I'd normally ne never do, avoiding slipping off the snow and so on. Maybe it's the stress of the, the difficulty of the terrain that made me lose my appetite anyway. So that's what I wanted to talk about, you know. Uh, I see some people coming into the live chat. It doesn't always get super busy, but sometimes I have more or less viewers. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, go ahead and ask me anything. I'll, uh, I'll usually respond to uh, Good questions. Uh, but <clears throat> I have some things to talk about more than just my personal stories. Uh, I was thinking about what I call future scams. And let me try to explain that. Um, as a society, it is necessary to look ahead to see what is coming at us for our survival, right? We're basically navigating the dark here. No one knows what the future will bring. And states obviously also don't know this. 
So states try to resolve try to resolve this problem in two manners. Firstly, by really uh, focusing on what they can control, uh, and then also <clears throat> trying to bring the unknown under control. So there's the known and the unknown. They try to make the known more controllable to optimize it. This is called probably the economy with the use of technology. And then we bring the unknown, the unexpected future, uh, more under our control if we venture out with, say, innovation. So innovation in this, in this sense means we're developing AI, we're developing electricity in the past, right? And we're, we're developing... Uh, this thing that I have on screen right now is a tokamak, is a nuclear fusion reactor. And the nuclear fusion reactor is supposed to mimic the processes that we see on the surface of the sun. On the surface of the sun, we have uh, a, a certain thing going on that keeps on burning. And if you can replicate that here on Earth, you should technically uh, make a lot of money uh, <laughs> because you're generating a lot of energy. So far, however, the tokamak, this thing, the, the, the fusion reactor, uh, doesn't work. We have spent a lot of energy on it, but it has not produced any energy for us yet because we don't even know for sure if it will work. It, this kind of thing has never been done before. And so there's another example of the, uh, the quantum computing system. They're now trying to build quantum computers in big halls with complex machines, really big machines that are supposed to bring down the temperature of that room to as low as possible, uh, 400 degrees Fahrenheit below zero. I would have to Google how much it is, but I suppose there's a there's an absolute zero, which is about minus 273 Kelvin. I don't know if this helps me. I don't know if it will give me the answer. Google is very clever in giving these basic answers, you know. How many Celsius is, yeah, 200 degrees below Celsius, 200 degrees Celsius below zero or 400 degrees uh, Fahrenheit below zero. And the whole, the whole thing about this is uh, if you bring the temperature that low, you can start doing quantum computing or so they say. The scientists say so. They've done the research. They claim this is so-and-so. And yet it is a big leap whether or not quantum computing will actually work. In fact, for the past few years, I totally forgot about the threat of quantum computing. I used to be more, more up to date about it because I was working in crypto a few years ago. So quantum computing could be a threat to certain cryptographic uh, uh, proofs. But it turns out even Bitcoin is actually uh, quantum proof already. Anyway, the new, the new addresses that start with the number three or so, they are actually quantum proof. So that's solved. Uh, but it, it doesn't appear to be a threat anymore, does it? If you forget about something like this, oh, it's not even a big deal anymore. What are we waiting for? Just get it to work. But they haven't gotten it to work. Presently, there is no, uh, no real uh, quantum computing going on. You know? uh, so, yeah. Uh, but my thing is, this is probably what I call uh, a future scam. We're working on uh, you know, the tokamak, the nuclear fusion, we're working on AI, working on quantum computing. Nobody knows for sure whether these things, whether these, uh, <laughs> sorry, my tongue twists sometimes when I try to pronounce English because I'm Dutch, right? So we don't know for sure if these technologies will actually work. Uh, oh, <laughs> oh, hi, it's my online friend, Sophia. I wish I could stay and watch. Keep going. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to do these live streams, um, uh, uh, daily almost I will talk about all sorts of things that will help our people ahead and so uh, thanks for joining <laughs> and I wanted to um, explain a bit about what I call these future scams is that big corporations they sell you AI they sell you quantum computing they sell you the tokamak the nuclear fusion reactor and they keep telling you these things will one day become real right but um, uh, what if they don't do you know what happens if the, this nuclear fusion doesn't actually work on Earth? What happens is uh, we spent, we burnt a lot of money without results. They say that this is the reason why, for example, the Roman Empire collapsed. Namely, the Roman Empire at its height, at its peak, needed a lot of energy, a lot of resources. So they use slaves, but slave labor obviously is limited. You need to house and feed them. So there's a limitation to how many slaves you can actually use in a society. And at the peak of the Roman Empire, about 50% of the uh, 
50% of the population was a slave. And in those days, the Romans didn't have access to oil yet. So because they could not innovate the technology fast enough to keep up with the growing uh, energy needs of the empire, that is likely the reason why the Roman Empire collapsed from within and then, uh, well, the Germanic uh, barbarians, quote unquote, invaded Rome uh, and sacked Rome, so to speak, right? Uh, someone from South Africa. Hello, how are you doing? Uh, and so I think it's entirely possible if, uh, if that the Western power or say the modern world as a whole, including China and Africa, that we will not be able to develop the technologies needed to advance ourselves. Say that the tokamak nuclear fusion doesn't work. AI, does, AI, AI isn't really intelligent, is it? It's fake. And then you have uh, uh, the tokamak and the quantum computing. Say quantum computing also doesn't work. Say right. So imagine a scenario where these big promised technologies don't actually come to fruition. They don't materialize, right? And you know what happens then? The society will necessarily have to shrink. If you cannot get access to the technologies you need to keep funding your growth, you will see a collapse of your civilization. Now, I don't like to uh, predict doom and gloom, but I do want us to be prepared for the, for the situation, for this bad outcome, in case technology just doesn't work, you know? Oh, one more from South Africa, Balthasar. How are you doing? And so I think we need to think more sanely, more logically about what's going on in our world. Uh, we have to like uh, uh, prepare for the possibility that we will not be able to have access to these advanced science fiction technologies uh, and that humanity may need to do something very different. What, for example, might happen if we are unable to keep up in terms of energy, unable to keep up with the population growth in the world, the population will have to shrink. But how? what will that look like? Well, technically, it's not even Europeans doing the damage here. The European native populations have already uh, reached a peak and are already shrinking. The only reason that countries like Germany or the Netherlands have a seemingly growing population is due to immigration. It, it has nothing to do with the births of uh, of native children. They are not being born anymore. This is, people are not having those children anymore. And so you see that while the native populations are already shink, shrinking, uh, the immigrants are only there in the same manner that the slaves were there in ancient Rome, in the city of Rome. They are there to, to be the labor force, but you can't keep doing that. There are limitations to how many people you can feed and house due to the energy cost of building housing, for example, or heating homes in Northern Europe, for example, there's limitations to all these things. And so if you thought that immigrants coming to Europe were going to somehow pay for the pensions of the old boomer generation, and maybe later even my generation, you'd be wrong because they won't be able to do that. And, and then what happens? You have to then, well, starve off the elderly, Right? Nobody is looking forward to that, but that seems to be something that may become more and more necessary, that we need to starve off more of the elder people in Europe. Um, primarily, for example, you know, in, in, in primitive societies, they actually do that. They give old people, if, if there are too many old people and they become a burden to society, they give them several options, like either you, you know, stop eating or you eat less voluntarily, or we make you stop eating, we starve you on purpose. Uh, and in some cases, elderly people are even uh, kind of pushed toward suicide, like why don't you just suicide yourself? And in very rare cases, even the elderly are actually killed. So imagine that it comes to this in Europe, we have a very old population, very, we have like many people over age 50 in Europe. It's ridiculous how many people we have here that old, whereas the younger generations, despite immigration, are very small relatively. It's totally impossible. The young generations will not be able to take care of the elderly in, in countries like Germany or the Netherlands or Belgium. So you come to this point where either we magically uh, learn to house millions and millions and millions of immigrants just to take care of the elderly, or we accept that the elderly will have to go. You know, this is very rude, but 
uh, nobody likes to talk about these kinds of things. Everybody thinks that we'll manage this, but I don't believe in, in promises like that. Anyway, uh, I had some more things to talk about here. Uh, okay, I'm going to switch topic a little bit. Uh, Xi Jinping, the Chinese leader apparently, is also trying to build a rules-based order with a rule of law uh, in China. And my first impression was, well, that's odd. Why is he doing the same thing we do in the West? Why is he copying a Western idea, basically, introducing the rules, rules-based rules order or rule of law? Now, someone else explained this to me, that Xi Jinping is actually trying to prevent another period of warring states. And, of course, the West would be interested in causing there to be a warring state period in China. The inner turmoil would, uh, would, sw uh, would sweep China off of its feet, and so you don't want to do that, you know? Uh, Oh, someone asks here, Adam Seven thinks, uh, what do you think about Joram van Klaver? Well, if he really converted to Islam, he's a traitor. And otherwise, is it possible he's like a secret service asset and he merely converted for, for public relations purposes with uh, Saudi Arabia? Who knows, you know? Uh, I had contact with him once on Twitter. Uh, we had some private like DMs uh, back and forth about a book by the black uh, American intellectual. I forgot his name. Uh, what is it? White, red, black, rednecks, or there's this book. Sowell, Thomas Sowell. Yeah, he recommend he recommend here. Joram van Klaver recommend. He's a Dutch politician. He recommended me this book, Black Rednecks and White Liberals by Thomas Sowell. I actually read it. It is a good book, though. So, uh, yeah, I personally, well, can't stay. Have a good stream. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, so I was talking about Xi, the Chinese president, and Xi is doing so, building the rule of law into the Chinese society, which they never had before, and primarily probably to prevent warring factions and warring families uh, from, you know, uh, sending China into turmoil, right? So that's why, you know. And I, I was wondering, like, is she perhaps a puppet of the West? Because if he's doing something we do in the West, maybe he's a puppet. But I think that's not true. I don't think she is a puppet of the West. I think rather what is happening is that she recognizes that the world likes the idea of a rules-based order that the West has been trying to push ever since uh, Elder Bush, George H.W. Bush, right? And to push something like the, the rules-based order, uh, but from a Chinese perspective, might the Chinese rules-based order perhaps be able to compete with the Western idea of it with more Chinese or more Asiatic ideals, then you have an instant problem because uh, East Asia plus India represents almost, almost 5 billion people, right? And 5 billion people is a majority already. So if China comes up with something like a rules-based order, to compete with the Western version of a rules-based order, theirs would be different, of course. They would have different principles, right, that are more um, more in tune with Asian populations and more in tune perhaps also with African and uh, Arab populations and so on. And as a consequence of that, the West would really come to stand alone. We will have our stupid, silly little, uh, uh, silly little, you know, uh, rules, <laughs> the rules-based order that no one else wants to abide by. And that is that might be the ultimate political death blow to Western supremacy when the world decides, okay, we do like the idea of a rules-based order, just not yours. We want the Chinese version of the rules-based order because maybe China actually listens more to, uh, to what the other peoples have to say rather than impose values on them. This is the big mistake of the West is that we try to impose our values onto other people rather than to understand you need to have a pluriform world, not a universal world. The Russians also understand this. They always talk about the multipolar world rather than the unipolar American-led West. And that I agree to. Uh, you cannot impose the American-led West onto the world and their values of what LGBT and feminism and veganism, this is precisely not what people want. People want almost the exact opposite, you know. Uh, Strongman Aiden says, 5 billion people, but how many of those people are super remote living? I don't know what you mean by that, but do you think the West needs them more or they need the West more? 
uh, presently China is the rising star in the economic world and, and uh, eventually people may need China more than the West. And I think in, at that tipping point, the West is going to have a very big trouble convincing people they should uh, side with us. And this is one reason, I think, why they have open borders, right? In the Western world, we have open borders to try to get all the people to come live with us, hoping that their home nations will also uh, keep in tune or keep in touch with us rather than switch over to China. But I think that's going to happen anyway, eventually. I think people are going to... Uh, what I think might happen is that uh, China could become the economic powerhouse of the world, overtaking the USA. And at that point, very slowly, finance, culture, politics of the world slowly becomes more in line with what China is promoting. And then the West will either have to go along with that or, or be messed up, really. The West may, uh, may not survive that. But... I see an opportunity in everything, even if this were to happen, that the rules-based order switches over to China, to the Chinese model of it, and the world starts following China, and the world moves away from the West, and the West could become, in that scenario, a third world backwater. But I do think this provides, precisely this provides an opportunity for us Europeans to start with something completely entirely new. We Europeans would then also be able to break away from the American-led Western world and we might actually rekindle our own values and our own principles and assert those aggressively or at least assertively uh, and at the very least begin to dominate Europe again, that we are in charge of Europe again. And this is basically uh, what I think of, you know. Uh, the flag behind me represents Odin's raven, which is a, a, a symbol from uh, indeed a Viking flag. And the flames are my own design. This is my uh, podcast flag, basically. And so uh, we need to watch out uh, for the rules-based order coming out of China rather than out of Hillary Clinton's uh, offices. Uh, uh, oh, now that I'm talking about China anyway, there, have you heard there's a new lung infection disease going on in, in the Western world and also in China? What do they call it? The white lung disease? What if it's just pneumonia with a new name? Huh? Uh, and they're trying to push... Because if you give, the, you give an existing disease a new name, you can sell new medication. Is this going to be COVID 2.0? Or I should say COVID. I can't say co uh, on my streams on TikTok. Sorry, on TikTok because I'll be, uh, I'll be suspended, right? I'm Dutch and I am also a descendant of Danish Vikings. I have like 18% Danish Viking ancestry. And also I have a lot of Swedish ancestry. Uh, yeah, so I get to do whatever I want, you know? The whole notion of cultural appropriation is nonsense. And in this particular case, I'm actually a descendant of the, of the Danish Vikings because they came to the Netherlands to uh, rob our women, basically, and sleep with them. So I'm one of those offspring people. I'm not sure if there were ever real Dutch Vikings. The Viking culture, of course, is the, is the Scandinavian. Uh, but I'm pretty sure the Frisians were involved there to some extent. And uh, Apparently, they met my people as well we, we got in touch and we mixed and i'm an, i'm i'm the product of this the vikings fought the frisians yeah that's awesome i wish i was there i would love to be involved in fights like that so do you think that the new lung disease that they keep talking about could this be like another years of lockdowns and and face masks and so on i'm unvaccinated i refuse to play along with the game uh, I was very saddened by the whole process. I really felt excluded from society. Uh, it really changed my opinion of people. The people I used to look up to, for example, older people, they got so scared from what was really just the flu, in my view. And, and I just couldn't believe that they had allowed themselves to be brainwashed that much. And then I realized they had always been that brainwashed. Because they watch regular TV and they, they listen to the evening news. That's what most, most people after dinner watch the evening news, right? And they believe it. They think that's the objective truth being revealed to them. It doesn't re they don't realize that it's just practically fake, you know? Yeah, another lockdown means the economic destruction of Europe. Yes, that, that is what I also agree to, yeah. Uh, Dot asks or says... I'm half Norwegian and always uh, buy my buy my Dutch husband Viking jewelry every Christmas. Oh, that's very interesting. So there are women watching my show. Or, <laughs> also, uh, 
only 20% of my viewers on TikTok are women, 80% men. So I kind of tailor my content nowadays for this kind of audience, you know. Unfortunately, someone was says they were vaccinated, but they don't feel good anymore. I hope it was not caused by the uh, by the vaccine, you know. No more shots. Well, I never had any. I'm never going to take them. Uh, I just don't don't tolerate this, you know. I'm lucky that I didn't take the vaccine, yeah. We'll see. I might get in trouble for not being vaccinated in the future. I might be excluded from society again. So it's a risk I took, and I'm, I'm going to stand by it. I can't condemn people who took the jabs because the, the pressure you got from the media and the government, it was astonishing the way you were, the way we were all basically told that if you don't take the jabs, you're, you're a racist, fascist, fascist, Nazi, nitwit, whatever. It's really bad, you know? So uh, I hope that we are not seeing the birth of yet another lockdown phase because, you know, I've had enough of this. Oh, I have this big topic as well that I wanted to talk about is that uh, I had the idea today. I was walking to the supermarket and I came up with this strange idea. What if leftism in general is actually a corporate front, like the whole thing we call leftism nowadays, a corporate front. So let me go through some examples here, what I mean by it. Um, a study in Spain showed that a 17 percent increase in population due to migration uh, led to a 50% rise or 50% or more rise in housing prices. The real estate went up. Obviously, you have more people, more demand for real estate, and all of a sudden people will have to work harder to make more money to pay for their mortgages and so on. And so what if, and of course this report from 2013 from Spain, of course everybody in the real estate world must have read that kind of report, right? And do you see what I mean by this? Do you see what I mean? What if the, the really rich people who own so much real estate had the idea, why don't we open the borders of Europe to more people? Because that's how we make the housing value go up. And then they would have more money relative, say, to other rich people in Asia or Africa or India and so on, right? or the USA. Oh, I need a little sip. Even veterans were scared into taking the vaccines. Yeah, or, or, or you'd lose your job, right? They'd fire you, dishonorable discharge. And now they're begging them back. In the USA, they're begging these uh, unvaxxed pilots and so on to please, please come back because we need to go to war with Russia. Right? Uh, this is weird. COVID is really a big uh, con, yeah, con vid, yeah. Anyway... I was talking about the housing market in Europe and what they're doing is if you want to squeeze out some more money out of your business, then just open the borders to immigrants. You force, you create an artificial higher demand for housing, right? <clears throat> and so the housing prices temporarily go up. You can take profit, you can sell or dump on the market. And who cares if other people are, are holding empty bags, as they say, right? An empty bag means you're old, you've, you still have your house, but it won't be worth as much as what you paid for it anymore. It will be underwater, as they say. I think that's actually going to happen, that the big corporations are going to figure out the right timing to dump the housing market, to exit the housing market, and then everybody else still owning a house will simply be screwed. You know, in, in, in the net, countries like the Netherlands for the last 50 years, we only saw a rise in... Uh, in pricing and in, in housing power, right? Uh, sorry, in, uh, in housing prices. And so people expect that's how it works. You, you're supposed to work hard, get a house, own it, right? And then get a mortgage. And then one day it will, it will be worth more than what you spent on it in interest rates. And that's just not going to happen anymore. It's just going to be over, you know? You know? Ironically, now there's the... The vax-free blood is now in demand for surgeries. <laughs> really, someone was, they threatened to take you, or they threatened you to take the job or lose your job. Yeah, those are uh, authoritarian. That's the real fascism, isn't it? You know, that's real authoritarianism, you know. Thoughts on Sweden? What do you mean in terms of the vax? Uh, I was in Sweden for a few uh, for a year or so during the vax uh, lockdowns, and they had everything open. So I think Sweden, in this respect, was the only normal country in Europe. They were at least they were sane about how to treat people. You know, 
Exactly. Migration only actually benefits the elites who own all of the assets and, and the real estate, I assume. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, said Josh. Uh, that's how it is. They, they, they're, they're, the people who own most of the infrastructure and the, and the assets and the real estate, they can just make decisions for our nations, right? Uh, that are in their benefit paid for by the people who just either have to work harder or just die out. Uh, and this is just not right. We need to have something new, something better to live for than merely just being the lemmings of uh, lining the pockets of the rich and the CEOs and the owners and so on. Is there nothing else we can do? And, and I, I would like to cut loose from this silly rat race and focus more on on a more cultural connection, more spiritual connection between people through through the expression of new culture, really. So in a, in a larger sense, I was talking about leftism being a corporate construct. Uh, so I gave you the example of housing. They will tell you we need immigration because of... Uh, you know, humanitarian reasons and universalism. We're all equal and the world belongs to everyone. And really, it's just about lining the pockets of the big real estate multinationals. And then you also have, for example, veganism. Why would veganism be merely a corporate excuse? Well, if big corporations in the food industry can figure out that they are able to produce vegan food at higher profit margins than they can produce, say, animal foods, then that's what they'll do. And then they'll, their media and their marketing programs will sell you this lie saying, okay, you got to switch to eating uh, vegan because meat is bad for you. No, no it's not. Meat is, the, meat is the healthiest food you can possibly eat, especially red meat, all right? Grass-fed red meat is the healthiest food in the world for everybody, for all human beings. And then they tell you not to eat that because they say, well, do it. Don't do it for yourself. Do it for the animals. You don't want to. I mean, a cow is like a big dog and you wouldn't kill and eat your dog, would you? Right. So that's how they talk to you when really they just think they can make more money off of selling vegan food. It's all it's a profit mar margin scam. But then again, leftists, they believe this. They, they buy into these lies that are really corporate lies. To, nowadays, if you're a leftist, you basically agree with Nike, Starbucks, McDonald's, Enron, uh, BP, Shell, you believe these companies, you think they're actually doing the right thing for you? No, they're scamming you into a leftism, which is just a corporate marketing excuse. And I had another example. Uh, so basically, thinking for yourself is now right wing. Anybody who doesn't believe in the narratives sold to us by big corporations, right, is a right wing neo Nazi fascist Christian totalitarian, right? Meaning you're, you're, you're sane. Well, that's just how it is. I gotta take another sip though. Uh, oh wow! Wait, oh, I have this one. What you see on screen? You see that <laughs> the nineteen-year-old uh, weirdo on the left? He looks like a clown, man. And the girl on the right. So this guy and his teenage friends—they had a gunfight. They fired sixty shots at random. And the girl got uh, accidentally hit. She was probably indoors and she got hit in the head and she died in the hospital. 19 year old girl or so and, uh, or 17 year old. And you know how, how weird this is? Whenever something like this happens where a random, you know, racially confused person kills this beautiful, pretty young girl. Right. Uh, the local news mentioned it once, but the big media, they never pick it up. They never talk about it. Uh, maybe I'm going to do that. Maybe every show, every time I do a live show, I'll bring up one of these cases just to remind people like, hey, ho, you know, uh, we, can't, we can't keep doing this. This shit has got to go. You know, it's just evil. You know, Jonathan Lewis, you remember that name? That was a kid who was stomped, stamped, stampeded to death by a pack of these. And then you have like the kid in Crepol, France, murdered by 20 foreign combatants, Islamists who wanted to kill white people. You have the, the children stabbed in the French playground and the children stabbed in, in Dublin and so on. It happens so often, but the, the local media, they mention it once and then forget about it. And then the next, com next one comes up, right? It's just so crazy, you know? Oh, there's a channel on Telegram called Every Day. 
yeah and they show you this okay that's really great i'm going to have a look at that as well then so i can i can also then mention this on my shows every day we need to make it very clear to people that diversity means death it does not mean strength yeah jonathan lewis yeah he uh his friend was being mugged and he said something or stood up for his friend and then he got stampeded to death it's it's awful you know you know we'll never vote our way out of tyranny no you either have to leave and start over or revolt and fight back but they don't want us to do either of these things they don't want us to fight back they don't want us to revolt but they also don't want us to leave we can just get up and leave and go somewhere else or i don't know we can move to siberia you know as an example and just start over but they don't want they don't want us to do that either because they need to milk us dry before they allow us to die you know that's what it really is clear them out clear them all out yeah that's jonathan bowden's speech right uh i i do listen to these speeches because of course they uh uh, Jonathan Bowden, some of the others, uh, Mosley, they speak really well in English. Like they were great speakers, you know. Uh, I, I, I made notes today because I have a lot of things to talk about. I was, I was just looking up, uh, see what else there was going on here. Yeah, <clears throat> uh, I mentioned this today that uh, what if separatism is our only real solution? Uh, Today, Joe Biden posted a tweet. And now, of course, he doesn't write his own tweets. There's a staffer who writes these tweets, right? President Biden sent out a tweet saying, well, the inflation percentage went down a bit. Therefore, uh, companies should, should stop charging more for their goods. But the whole point of inflation is as long as the inflation number is positive, the prices keep going up. There, if there's inflation, it keeps going up. And so just because inflation dropped from 3% to 2.5%, then the prices still go up. They don't actually go down. But of course, the staffer who writes his tweets doesn't understand the economy, right? And can you guess then, can you guess then who is really writing those tweets? It's got to be a member of a certain demographic who don't grasp uh, economic abstractions or mathematical abstractions very well. So it's Obama. The Obama administration, this is Obama's third term. Biden is a puppet. The Black Panthers have their arm to their you know to their elbow deep up his ass he, the guy is a puppet on a string you know do you think gen z is too far gone to change well i don't know i think the younger generations gen z gen alpha they're the last either they're the last generation or the best generation you, you can't really do much you know Uh, zoomers yeah a few years ago we used to call i'm old right <laughs> we used to call gen z generation zycon you were going you were going to be the generation who was going to actually fight back and win you know with our support obviously yeah we'll make a comeback lads of course of course yeah uh, exactly a basketball player american probably wrote that tweet yeah we all know um, the basketball players you know uh i thought uh i've been speaking for uh, uh 45 minutes or so uh, i thought maybe i'll go to the google arts section and talk a little bit about whatever's to see there google arts culture I noticed that sometimes on the internet they start deleting things. There used to be a, a letter written by Winston Churchill, uh, sorry, where he spoke about the Jews, about the leftist Jews, the communist Jews, the Bolsheviks, and the Zionists. And this letter, I tried to find it. I remember reading it online once, and it's been completely scrubbed off the internet. They are actually able to do that. There's something else I was looking for. Remember a while back, was it this, this year or last year, Macron, President Macron of France, paid a visit to, a Fr to Africa and he was snubbed. They let him walk down the red carpet all by himself. Normally somebody is supposed to welcome him and greet him, right? And then when Macron put his hand on this black guy's shoulder, that guy wiped it off. He wiped off uh, Macron's hand. And it was so telling. But again, the video of that was probably completely scrubbed. I couldn't find even the, even the mention of it in, 
in the news was gone. You know, maybe I didn't look well enough for it, but but they're scrubbing things. And also here on Google Arts and Culture, you know, they say this contains a lot of art, right? But and let me Google Germany, for example. Germany, I want to see German paintings. The thing with this is uh, there used to be uh, some Germanic art on here of the of Valhalla and so on and Odin. And I could, and and then later they they erased that again. It's like they they are actually slowly erasing some things here, you know. Let's see, uh, landscapes. I'll put up some pictures on screen if it works well. Let's see how this goes. Oh, you Google Germany, and the first thing you get is the star, right? Okay. Uh, maybe what is it called? Just want to go through some paintings or whatever here. German art and artists in the Groma Museum. Let's have a look at this one. What's this mean to you? This is the industrial age in Germany, see? The masters of technology. Little did they know that, you know, this age would end so poorly for all of us. It would end in diversity and shit, you know? Yeah, didn't like that. Germany has produced many magnificent painters, particularly over the last two centuries. Uh, and Milwaukee, oh, the American Museum is fortunate to have works by the great German artist in the collection of the Groman Museum in Milwaukee, an institution dedicated to industrial art and artistic depictions of human labor. Okay, could be interesting. Let's see, let me describe this a little bit. It's a bit strange. The umbrella against the leaking, right? And then he has his hat on a stove or not? On a stove pipe. You know, why did men stop wearing hats? You know, I'm going to make a video about that uh, later, uh, later next week or so. Uh, I like to watch, uh, I like to look at paintings simply to get an impression of what life was like before photography. And in paintings, they put a lot more effort into the meaning of it all, right? So, you know, Imagine being like this, like a worker or something. This is your bed. This is your whole place, apparently. And you uh, you live in someone's attic, you know. <laughs> this is whatever, you know. Oh, look at this. Look at this. Maybe it's not very clear on, uh, on TikTok what I'm looking at. But you can watch the replay of this on my YouTube channel later at The Great Johannes. I've never been to South Africa I did want to go hiking there once. I like hiking, but I never went there in the end. Does Africa still pay 500 billion US dollars each year to col as colonial tax? I doubt all of Africa even produces that much money in a year, man. That sounds a bit unbelievable. I think a lot of it is just made up. Uh, what is happening, though, is that since Africans don't have an industry to use any of their own resources, uh, and Europe does, USA does, China does, increasingly also India does, the resources go to the places where they are needed for production. And if Africans don't like that, they should build their own industries. I once made a video on my TikTok channel where I, where I said what Africa needs is engineers, technologists, and entrepreneurs. That video was reported for racism, even though I told them the truth. I literally told them what to do. You need to have more technical people, start building your own industries, be the entrepreneurs, right? And start making everything on your own there in, in Africa. And then you won't have to sell your resources to other industrial places anymore. You can just keep it to yourself, you know? I love pictures like this here. Life on a farm. Let me see. They're 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 uh, they're growing potatoes here. It's a potato field, and they're reaping uh, they're they're reaping what they sowed before. You know, this is this is, and in the background you have some cattle there apparently. Yeah, but this is how how a lot of people want to live, right? You want to have a farmhouse out in the field. Oh, look! If you look closely in the top left, there is actually a big farmhouse there. The triangular shapes are farmhouses, and and you can have a big family. You be outdoors most of the time. You know, even the women and children can come to help. So you will be living with your family. Nowadays, a man goes to an office during the day. You don't see your family. You you're away from your family. But here, you can be out in the field. And you can see your family. Your kids can come along to play next to you. 
and your kids can be, uh, you know, you, you actually have a much better connection with your children who are actually also from the earliest ages able to help you out. You know, children, when they become two or three years old, they can walk, they can talk, they can start operating machinery. And when you have a farm, that's why you want to have five or six or seven children. First of all, it's easy to feed them because you have a farm. And secondly, the children, they actually help out on the farm. They can do all sorts of tasks. They can milk cows. Five-year-olds can milk cows, right? So I suppose you shouldn't overexhaust them, all right? But you can definitely put them to work. They can literally earn their own existence from when, when they're five years old. Nowadays, we have this this almost invented notion of the innocent childhood where we say children up to age 14 should not be allowed to do any meaningful work. They should just go to school and have their brains washed by, by communist educators, right? And then we don't teach them any real skill. They spend their lives indoor, which means when they do go outside, they get sick very easily, right? So, so we have to give them vaccinations because we kept them indoors when they should have been outdoors from, from, from early ages, right? To become more immune to all sorts of diseases you know this is this is this is the real problem we trans we transitioned europeans from a largely outdoor rural life to an indoor office life and a, and a classroom life and we called it progress but really it harmed us it harmed our spirits our souls our minds our bodies you know this is just so bad you know I'm going to block this Afrocentrist delusional moron. You're just mentally ill. Get lost. Technology didn't come from Africa. Europeans basically invented almost all technology. What's this? This is a... These women, they're making some. I can't really make out what it is, you know. Oh, here, it's a great painting of, uh, of the industrial age, right? I don't know, maybe I should enlarge them a bit. I don't know if I can do that on screen, probably not. That doesn't matter, you know. Just go and go to Google. I typed in German Impressionism, and then you have this one. There's a gallery with these industrial uh, paintings. So, uh. Uh, a bunch of guys doing some hot firework. Okay. We can expand it a little bit. Oh, that's it. That was it already. That was it. That was this whole gallery. Well, I liked to see it anyway. Yeah, I have a lot to say. All right. I'm going to close this one. Uh, <laughs> later. Yeah, later, dude. Yeah, you know, we used to say 1350, right? The 13% responsible for 50% of the crime and murder. It's actually 1360. Some Asian guy went to check it out. He made a video. He looked at the actual F FBI statistics over the past few years. Th and then he did the math. And they're smart and with math. You know, they're smart with math. And they said, oh, it's not 1350. It's 1360. Uh, black people are 13% of the U.S. population, but they are responsible for over 60% of the murders, whereas the 60% of white people are only responsible, uh, you know, of, for 35% of murders. So they're, they're like, that means that black people are actually 12 times more likely to commit murder than the white people living in the USA. That's really, that's really insane. That is so insane. You know, this, this fact alone warrants you to just move into these black neighborhoods and just crack down. There's something deeply wrong there. Whatever it is, it needs to be fixed because you cannot go on living with them like that. If they're so violent, it's impossible. You can't do this. Yeah, there's a lot of these nutters out there, these Wakanda Afrocentrists. Wherever they get their information, it's totally delusional. And when they say things like that, it makes them look pretty much insane to even believe that, you know? Because Asians don't believe that, Indian people don't believe that, Arabs don't even believe that, you know, Europeans don't believe it. You know, it's just them, these weirdo Af Afrocentrists, you know. They're not all right. You know? Those who commit crimes and those who enable it has a psyche, uh, has a psycho pleasure from those actions. Yeah, I suppose so, yeah. 
Apartheid South Africa had under 500 murders a year. Now in black ruled SA, over 27,000 murders a year. You know. But it is largely themselves killing themselves, right? It's most, but of course in South Africa, you have the attacks on the farmers. You know. That's really horrible. I saw a movie about that. I think it was based on a book by Ernst Roots. What was it called? A movie called... I don't know what it was called. It was uh, something with the word grond in it. No. So a phrase toxic, ma the phrase toxic masculinity did not exist until leftist prevailed. Yeah, well, that's true. The crackdown on men and masculinity is some kind of weird feminist fetish where they think men are the problem for some reason. But that too is just an invention. Right? Men were never the problem. They were the solution to a lot of problems. Now they say we're the problem because of why? Because perhaps... In order to maintain the luxury standards, you can reduce your family size down from seven children to one child. And then all you can do next is get rid of men. And maybe that's what they're trying to do. They, they just want to hold on to the wealth rather than just give up the wealth and return to a more healthy spiritual world. You know, Women used to respect men. I think many women still respect men anyway. But um, because of feminism, they are taught to hate men in ways that they don't even understand, you know. All right, all right. I'm gonna I'm gonna close off this live because I uh, I ran out into the fifty almost an hour now. I'm gonna do this every day. So uh, tomorrow again, probably around seven or eight p.m. Uh, European time, I'll be back here. You can get my subscription at www.jmk.info. That's my Substack, and I'm gonna repost this video to my uh, to my YouTube channel at the Great Joannas. All right. Many men only want the physical thing and nothing else now. Yeah. I wonder, you know. I often feel that women are just so materialistic, they forget that men actually also need love. You know, maybe. And I mean this, the emotional love, right? And it's hard to get that from a woman too. So it's it's kind of, the, the feeling is mutual, you know. But okay, have a nice evening and I'll uh, see you tomorrow.